Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon to who is come, joining from China. My name is Alessio Petino. I'm the knowledge coordinator of the USME Center based in Beijing. It is my great pleasure to be here today and to host this uh, webinar. Uh, today, the topic is about um, the two new regulations published by the Chinese customs a few months ago that are causing a lot of uh, pain and, and, and troubles among many European food and drink producers. Uh, we have been approached by many um, companies, uh, at least at those, uh, my several dozens of companies in the in the previous weeks um, asking us questions about this uh, procedure and this is why today we are partnering up with two excellent consulting firms and speakers to deliver this webinar today so um we, we, we are going to have four speakers. Um, the first presentation will focus on some practical tips from uh, 12 years of experience about what types of um, you um, food and beverage brands are successful in China on the long term and why. While the second presentation will focus on the what, why, where and who needs to register on the customs platform. And it will also include some um, aspects relating to labeling. Third presentation will guide you through this registration procedure on the system, on the custom systems. Um, while uh, the last presentation will be, we, we, uh, we are very uh, privileged to be joined by an officer from, from Chinese customs who will provide, who will provide an interpretation of these uh, provisions. Um, before um, we start, I would like to make a couple of remarks um, if you have any questions and i believe many of you are uh, have many questions please submit them in the q a section which you can find on the bottom of the of the zoom um, but i would also actually welcome you to actively exchange information interact in the chat uh, maybe introduce who you are what kind of problems are, do you have and, uh, and and exchange your views and, and ideas with uh, with all the other participants second remark is that um, today's webinar we are now using english but at some point we will switch to chinese and um, and in order, but we have arranged simultaneous interpretation. And in order to access it, you have to click on the interpretation button on the bottom and select English. I will let you know when we are going to switch into Chinese. Um, also, I would like to spend a couple of minutes about the on the USME Center. We have many new um, participants today who never join our events. So um, the USME Center is a project funded by the European Commission. It was it started to be funded since 2010. And our objective is to help European small and medium enterprises to export to China and to get ready to do business uh, with uh, China. Uh, we are in a third phase and which will run until March 2022. But then there will be a fourth phase coming. So, so we will be around for a while. Um, we are implemented by a consortium of five chambers of commerce and business organizations, which you can find on the bottom of the slide. And among these, uh, with the coordinator is the China-Italy Chamber of Commerce, who has been very um, active in supporting or the organization of this webinar. Um, we partner up with a lot of uh, government business agencies, and we have a physical office in Beijing, which is where I am from. Um, I am now. Um, very briefly, we provide four types of service. Um, one is the knowledge center. Basically, we write reports, guidelines, and case studies on different aspects uh, of, of, of doing business with China, sector-specific reports, but also on cross-cutting issues. We have also an advice center, which is a sort of help desk that um, through which we provide technical assistance to SMEs which have questions to us. You can send us questions anytime and we will have experts answering this uh, for you for free. We have a training center, basically that what we're doing now, um, we organize training sessions on different aspects. And last, we have an advocacy platform through which we try to disseminate information about new regulations or draft for comments on regulations and so on. Um, we are going to have a lot of other activities um, this month, but also in, in, the, in the next ones. Um, some of them, as you can see, uh, 16 of January related to, well, non, it's pet food, but no, not human food, but um, then there will be another one also in January. It will be a big forum uh, on food and drinks. Uh, we have issued recently a series of reports which uh, might be useful for, for the audience, um, including one on e-commerce, and uh, we are also uh, about finalizing one on private labeling for food and beverage products. And all, all this information you can find on, on our website for free. You just need to register 
register and you will need to be approved, but it, this will take a couple of working days. Um, we also have, um, as I mentioned, the, 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 this advice, uh, ask the expert function, frequently asked questions and so on. So I would invite you to visit our website if you, if you have not um, done it yet. Um, so now uh, I will move into the of this webinar. Um, I would introduce you the, the first speaker. Um, the first speaker is Lina. Lina, she's the founder and managing director of Litao Consulting Group. Litao is a full service China market entry solutions for food and beverage brands. And Lina is about to share with you how to be compliant with these regulations and, 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 to, and, and how to be more profitable in China. Lina has lived in Shanghai for 12 years. She is very fluent in Chinese and she has um, closed negotiations, uh, business negotiations um, with over 1,000 successful B2B meetings. Um, she will also help you navigate the current landscape for European food and beverage brands. Um, and we help you understand how you can win Chinese consumers' trust and succeed long-term in China. So um, Lina, uh, because she's traveling in these days, so um, her connection is not uh, very stable. So, uh, but she has sent to us um, a pre-recorded presentation and I'm going to display it now. Thank you. Hey, thanks Liam for your nice introduction and thank you USME Center for having me here today. I have an important message, so I'm really happy to be able to present. Well, if anybody is here today, you already know that since January 1st, um, there is going to be a significant upgrade in how food and beverage products are being imported into China. I know that many of my European clients have gotten very stressed and even uh, angry, saying, wow, so there are new restrictions coming out in China again. However, I think that's not actually what's happening at all. Such uh, registration processes have existed in many countries, including the US and India for many years. And what China is doing right now seems like uh, it's just creating a fair playing field, which will actually be providing many benefits to premium imported food and beverage brands, especially the brands from the EU. I know that many of you haven't been to China for some time, so maybe it's difficult to imagine what the choices for the consumers in China might look like today. So let me give you a tour. Which one of these two products do you think is imported? The one on the left or the one on the right? Well, both of them have some Chinese, uh, both of them have some English, but uh, they actually look very similar. Well, the product that's imported is uh, the one on the left. It's imported from Japan. Some of you might say, wow, Lina, you know, Japan, China, maybe it's similar cultures, maybe products do look the, uh, very similar. So let me give you another example. Which one of these two products do you think is imported? The one on the left or the one on the right? Well, there is a clue in this one. There is a fl French flag just above the brand Kiri, but they both look very similar. But the product on the left really embraces the fact that it's imported. It even says so in Chinese imported with original packaging from France. And this is an example of what looking, uh, working very closely with uh, a local distributor might look like. Um, this particular brand exports and distributes in over 120 countries. And so they know that this is exactly the way to do it. But in this case, um, the differences between these two products are not extreme because both of them are high quality products um, because the product on the right is also using European know-how as it is a subsidiary of a European firm. But in this case, it's a totally different story. Which of these products do you think is imported? Actually, none of them is imported, um, but this is what comes out if I insert uh, the, the Chinese name of Jägermeister, Jäger, into a Chinese shopping platform, Taobao. And many Chinese consumers don't know the English name because they're maybe lazy to read these complicated long names, or maybe they don't know English. Um, so they usually know your brand only by its Chinese name. So when you go to a KTV for a party in those smaller towns, it is expected that the KTV will prepare a set of drinks and snacks 
for the whole package of people who just arrived. Um, and there will be choices for ladies and for boys and uh, for the whole night. Mm, so I actually imagine that uh, somebody must have approached Jägermeister with this after noticing this market gap. Because happen that happens to me all the time with the distributors we work with. They listen to the consumers, they report back on how to build a product that's better. And that the one, the product that the consumer will be happy to buy. So in China, if you don't listen, there will be somebody who listens. And then they will have this very unfair competitive advantage. Uh, because they will not invest so much time in developing a product, they will not be spending so much money on developing this product, the product will be significantly cheaper because it is not imported, and they will have all this money to be spending on uh, marketing and sales activities and reaching those uh, consumers in KTV first. So when we get approached by a new brand, and that wants to enter China market, that's what we look at first. What are the local brands doing that we will need to learn in order to succeed in China market? Now, why is this regulation coming all out of the sudden? Well, nobody can tell for sure. There was no such, um, you know, public information revealed. Um, and it seems like it's already quite possible to know whether the product is imported or not by the label. But there have been cases where the labels have been significantly mishandled and the transparency um, in supply chain has become extremely important during the time of COVID-19. And uh, now with this regulation, there will be a number on the packaging which will show that it's been imported. And the Chinese consumers want that security. So it seems like this move is happening because the Chinese consumers have new demands. Now, what I noticed happen as a result of these regulations is that all serious exporters in the EU already started working with their importers very closely in filling in information about the products on the database. Now, the database uh, is sometimes in English, sometimes in Chinese, but mainly in Chinese if you go deeper into it. So it is a very positive development that they really work as a team. However, I want to stress um, again and again that uh, getting this registration number doesn't mean that you're compliant with Chinese market regulations or Chinese food and beverage standards. It only means that you have a number. So it is very important to go through required checks and uh, see whether this product really adheres to the Chinese regulations. So the speaker after me will be talking to you about what they do and how they do these uh, compliance checks. Um, they're always analyzing the national standards, they're identifying the suitable HS codes for China market, and now they even started working to help you register for this GCC uh, registration code. So the next speaker will be talking about this. But now, allow me to share um, some examples of how I have worked with uh, my clients to achieve long-term success in China. So first, I think it's very important to have the right way to present yourself and to present your product. Here on the left is an example of a European product listing. And to your eyes, there's nothing wrong with it. The listing is about the product. Now on the right you see a Chinese product listing and you might be surprised to see the flowers on, on the cutting board. I personally cannot imagine flowers on my cutting board. So what has it got to do with the mayonnaise? Well, let me share a different perspective. Um, I approached my teammate uh, with this question. She has a master's degree from the US, she's 25, she's returned to China, highly educated. I asked her why like this. Well, she said, you have to understand that uh, I'm a single child. Um, so she's cared for by her parents, by four grandparents, and all of these people have been saving up to 60% of them, their income every month 
in order to be able to provide a better future for her. So everything was always prepared for her. So she wants that experience. She says, I want to see that this product has been prepared for me. So understanding this mindset of a Chinese consumer is what my company does. Because if you went to any of Chinese, on Chinese e-commerce site with a European style product listing, you will fail. Now, this slide shows the uniqueness of my company, the USP. We help the clients localize when working uh, with the Chinese distributor. The product above, mayonnaise, is a great product, but we know like this it will not be selling in China because the consumers, they have different eating habits and therefore their needs are significantly different. This product in China is seen as a premium item for a premium lifestyle. Therefore, we needed to redesign it to make it look premium, uh, make smaller packaging, um, to make the product sweeter, so change all the formulation, um, to create a lifestyle where this product could be consumed, and now it's successful. And this is an example of a Chinese B2B communication. You can see the products are presented in painstaking detail. This is the product, this is what it's, what's in it, this is how it's cooked, this is the kind of people that would be eating it, this is how it's eaten. But it, if you look very closely, you will see that all of this information is not only in the catalog, but also on the product packaging itself. So maybe for you it would look redundant. But this is how the B2B catalogs in China usually look. And the reason why it's not redundant is because the, ch the things keep changing so rapidly. And it's more important to have the speed than to have perfection in China. And you need to be able to grasp the key information very quickly. The distributors themselves need to, e to be educated. They need to know that you care about them. And they need to know that you're here to answer any question. Unlike a European distributor who is likely to work things out themselves, the distributors here in China often have to educate their own sub-distributors before they can have these products on the shelves. So we need to leave them to do what they do best, to sell and to get the message across in their networks. And this is the kind of relationship you would have to be building with your supplier. This supplier makes more than 10 million euros a year and she is personally guiding us through her warehouse telling us all about the products that we can see in the warehouse or you have to make this kind of relationship this person when you talk to him he gives you his business card there is no email so you're forced to add him on wechat and you meet more than 500 such people a day and uh, you end up becoming friends first and only then business partners. And that's, I think, the key to understand business in China is that first you work with people and only then you work with companies. So if you think that you didn't understand China before, now after the pandemic, it's even more Chinese. So if you want to know more, I do have an email because I'm European please reach out and let's have a chat okay so this was the presentation from lena by the way lena she's uh online she's connected to this webinar so she will um uh, she will leave her contact um details here and at the same time she will be uh ready to interact with any of your questions um so thank you lena again and um also, another reminder, we will send all the slides after this webinar to all the participants. We are also recording the webinar and we will upload it on, our, on the USME Center's YouTube channel. So you can also rewatch it later. I will now move into the second presentation, uh, which I'm trying to, okay. Um, so so the, the second speaker is Mr. Raymond. Um, he's a regulatory affairs consultant and Accessra. Accessra um, 
is a very uh, niche and great consulting firm. And Raymond has um, extensive knowledge. He has a master's degree from the University of Nottingham. He has extensive knowledge on the Chinese food and beverage, cosmetics and pharmaceutical import and export regulations. He specializes in China's national standard and the impact that they have on international businesses. He has past insights and practical experience in dealing with Chinese market access requirement and has accumulated a successful track record of uh, with supporting international exporters with market entry into China. Um, so Raymond, thank you for being with us. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can show your slides and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, great. So very good morning to everyone. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for the introduction and Lena for her presentation. So um, my name is Raymond and I work for Accestra Consulting. So supporting with food and beverage companies with compliance and registration. So for the next 10 minutes, I will provide an overview of JCC registration before passing on to my colleague and, the, and then the customs officer to share in more detail. So the agenda of my presentation covers the four W's um, of GACC registration, what, why, who, and where. And the final half of the presentation will focus on the labeling requirements. So JCC stands for China Customs. And what is JCC registration? So the source refers to the release of two new policies, namely Decree 249 and 248. You may have heard of this uh, now. So Decree 249 is the measures on import and export food safety, whereas Decree 248 refers to JCC registration for food manufacturers. So according to these two policies, all food manufacturers exporting to China must register with GACC. So the key points for Decree 248 include all manufacturers for food, processors, storage facilities must be registered with GACC. And the registration deadline is on January the 1st, 2022. And it's important to register to avoid risk of customs clearance delays and also trade disruptions. So the scope of um, um, the scope includes all food and beverage products. And depending on the product category, the food producers must register with GACC through either two pathways. Either you register through the recommendation by the country competent authority or you register by self-registration, which I'll share in more detail later. All application materials should be submitted in English uh, or Chinese. The registration number should be indicated on the China label and also the carton. The registration validity is five years. So why GACC registration? So, it's a policy actually introduced under the China food safety law. And the purpose of the policy is to share the, risk, the, the food safety risks and the responsibilities to the manufacturer and also the exporter country government. This is so the local export government is held accountable for the enterprises they recommend. And the key objective is for the uh, food manufacturers to be more responsible for their food safety and also the quality of their production. So the end goal is to protect the Chinese consumer, to enhance consumer confidence and also trust in the food safety system. So there are two registration pathways. Either you register um, by yourself, uh, self-registration, or you obtain the registration by recommendation of the local competent authority. So who needs to register? 
So all overseas food manufacturers, um, including the manufacturing, processing and storage enterprises need to do the registration. But if you're an exporter, uh, not, not the manufacturer, processor or storage facilities, then you have to do um, a, a different type of uh, filing. So not this GACC registration. And customs divided the registration pathway according to the product category's risk level. So the higher the risk product category, such as meat, dairy, health foods, or others shown in the table under pathway one, this requires the registration by recommendation of the local competent authority. For all of the lower risk food categories, like your prepackaged biscuits, um, your uh, chocolates, um, these types of products would be considered lower risk. So GACC only requires the food manufacturer to do self-registration, or you can entrust a local agent like Accestra to support. So where to register? You shall register on the single window cipher platform where you can access on the following link shown on this slide. So if, if you've not registered already, you will firstly need to create an account, username and password. If you need assistance with the registration, you may contact me later for support with the registration. So this page is the interface after login. So you click the application for registration and on the left column, scroll down to the page, you see enterprise registration. You select the correct food category for your product. And then for the self-registration procedure, Lavinia and the GACC officer will provide more detail introduction after my presentation. And if you're not sure whether you should go through the recommendation pathway or the self-registration pathway, you can actually check and identify by inputting the HS code of your product. Um, so you can input by clicking on the product type on the left column, and then you can input the HS code in the search bar. And then the system will automatically show you whether you should self-register or not. And the result is highlighted in the right column here. If you have multiple product categories, then you can also search uh, the HS codes and check them all. Now, moving on to the labeling requirements. So as Lena mentioned in her presentation, after getting the GACC registration number, this does not mean that your product and labeling is approved and compliant by customs. It's not their responsibility to check compliance. So therefore, it is the manufacturer or the exporter's responsibility to make sure you're also compliant to the labeling regulations according to China's rules. And to make sure that your products are compliant to GB7718 and other related China national standards. So according to the new labeling standards under decree 248, the manufacturer shall mark the registration number or the registration number approved by the competent authority of the exporting country to be displayed on the inner and outer packaging of the food label. So one thing to note is uh, only the Chinese label requires the registration number whereas the original label um, in the native language does not, does not need. If the products are shipped to China after January the 1st deadline, without the labeling of the registration number, then according to the current policy, it's allowed to paste a separate sticker with the GACC number on the packaging when the products arrive into China. So not to worry. Um, usually the importer or a third party agent can support with labeling and pasting um, when the products arrive. So Lavinia and the JCC officer will share more details later about this also, or you can also ask during the Q&A. 
when designing a Chinese label, um, so you must comply with the Chinese labeling requirements. And usually there are nine mandatory items which you should include on the China label. So one is the product name, two is the net weight, three is the storage instructions, four is the nutritional panel, five is the shelf life, six is the ingredients list, seven is the contact information of the importer, eight is the country of origin, and most recently under the new decree, you have to also include the GACC registration number. So the exact layout and format and the requirement of how to label the registration number on the China label will be updated in due course. So please watch out for any policy changes and stay up to date. Thank you. And if you need, if you require GACC registration assistance or compliance, or you have any questions, you can feel free to get in touch on my email, info at accessstra.com. Alternatively, if you're China savvy and you have WeChat, you can also scan my WeChat code. So now I will pass on to Alicia to introduce Lavinia, who will, pro who will provide a more detailed um, information on the registration procedure and the steps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond, for the, um, for the excellent presentation. Now I'm delighted to introduce senior regulatory consultant at Accessra Consulting. She has over 10 years of experience in the food industry and she's an expert in China food laws, regulations and national standards. Her day-to-day -day job covers regulatory regulatory compliance in food labeling, product registration, and advising international companies with market access to China. So without further ado, we are very, uh, we thank and welcome Lavinia for, um, to present the procedures and the, step, uh, and the steps to register with JACC. Thank you, Lavinia. I'm, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can share your own slides. Oh, and, and by the way, the presentation, sorry, the presentation is going to be in Chinese. So uh, please uh, click on the interpretation button on the bottom and select English. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 大家好. Uh, 请允许我用中文开始做接下来的演讲。大家现在能看到我的屏幕吗? 可以的 OK 非常荣幸今天能够有机会与大家分享关于进口食品境外生产企业注册系统的内容我今天的演讲内容主要包含三个部分首先会对系统的使用须知做一个简单的介绍第二部分会介绍境外企业的注册流程最后会分享一些需要
。如果您的企业既生产十八类高风险食品，也包含十八类之外的低风险食品，那么建议您联系您的主管当局去获得分配的系统账号，而不是自己去申请账号。因为如果您自己的申请账号目前是无法去注册十八类高风险产品的。还有，在注册系统账号时，所有国家或地区的注册编号都是必填项，如果未填写，在登录系统后，您可以有一次机会进行补填。在注册的时候，请您仔细的核对需要填写的信息，因为注册完成后，向用户名、所在国家或地区等内容是无法进行修改的。下面我们就简单来看一下如何注册账户。如果是企业自己申请账号，那么先访问 c y p h e r 系统的主页，通过这个页面上的链接，然后根据要求在网页填写相关的信息。我们可以看到这边的网页中右上角有一个语言切换的图标，您可以通过点击这里来切换中英文。在这个网页上填写信息的时候，带星号的字段也都是必填项。填写完毕以后，点击这里的“立即注册”就可以完成用户账号的注册。注册完账号以后，登录进系统，点击我们这边右上角会有你的账号名称，可以进入用户信息管理界面。我们在用户信息管理界面中，可以对用户的相关信息进行修改，比如联系方式等等。请注意，如果您在申请账号的时候没有填写境外注册号，那么在这里，我们可以看到左侧这边有一个机会是可以让您补写这个注册号的，但是这个机会只有一次，一旦补充完毕，以后将无法进行修改。那么下面我们就来介绍一下境外企业的一个注册流程。首先是十八类食品的注册流程，这十八类产品呢是高风险的，是需要官方推荐注册的，可以分为一般审批流程、主管当局退回补齐补正流程和主管当局退回不予推荐流程。因为我们今天重点介绍的是企业自己注册的部分。所以也这里我就不展开介绍了。如果是十八类产品的企业注册，那么登录进 c y p h e r 系统以后，点击左侧这边的注册申请，然后在页面上选择主管需要主管当局推荐注册的产品类别，这边类别都会列出来，你去点击与你产品相对应的类别，并且填写相关的信息以后。就可以提交申请了。下面我们重点看十八类之外的食品的企业的自己做注册的流程。注册流程其实跟十八类之内的食品的流程是比较类似的，都分为一般审批、海关退回补齐补正以及海关退回不予注册流程。前面几个步骤是一样的。比如录入企业信息、生产相关信息和上传企业声明，以及其他需要提交的附件材料，然后点击提交，就能提交到海关总署。如果申请材料没有需要补正的内容，那么海关就会审批通过。一旦获得海关审批通过，您就能获得注册编号。如果有需要补齐补正的材料，您会收到海关的补齐补正回执，然后根据海关要求进行相应的修改后再重新提交。如果海关审批不通过，您会收到海关的不予注册回执。不予注册的原因可以在海关回执中查看。如果您还想是，如果您还是想要再提交申请，只能重新发起一个新的申请，而不能在原先的申请上进行修改后提交。它的申请方式和之前的十八类高风险产品类似，都是进入系统主界面，点击左侧的注册申请
。对于企业自己申报的产品类别，在页面的下半部分，我们找到您的产品对应的类别，然后点击进去，根据要求填写相应的材料后进行提交。在注册申请页面填写信息的时候，请注意所有带星号的内容都是必填项。其中，对于所在国家主管当局批准的注册编号这一项，系统会直接根据企业在注册账号时填写的数据进行反填，所以是不需要企业再次填写的，当然也是无法进行修改的。所在国家注册批准机构。这个是指企业所在国家授予企业资格的管理机构，这个是选填项。在华注册编号、在华注册时间和在华注册有效期都不需要企业填写。当您的注册审批通过后，系统会自动填写。企业名称是一个必填项，您可以根据实际情况进行填写。另外，你对华注册或增加的产品是必填项，您可以点击新增来录入多条产品信息。近两年出口贸易情况是一个选填项，其中的出口产品选项来源于之前填写的你对华注册或新增产品中的一些产品信息。<咳>企业声明部分需要先从 c y p h e r 系统中下载模板。然后呢，在这个模板上签字盖章以后，再上传扫描件到系统中。在附件信息这一这一页面中，您可以看到所有之前上传的一些附件材料，并可以进行编辑。好了，上面介绍的是在申报页面填写时的一些注意事项。在您提交注册申请以后，您可以从 c y p h e r 系统主页的左侧栏中找到申请单查询功能，点击这里就可以查询到您的一些申请状态，包括海关的回执等内容，都可以在这里进行查询。第三个部分，我想要介绍一下这次。企业注册需要说明的问题以及一些注意点。首先，有些企业可能不太确定自己应该通过官方推荐注册还是自己注册。那么，在 c y p h e r 系统中，可以通过产品类别查询功能来确认您的注册途径。点击这里的产品类别查询，在页面上输入 HS code 或者产品的名称，点击查询以后。就可以搜索到该产品的类别以及是否需要官方推荐注册。建议在这里用 HS Code 进行查询，而且这里的 HS Code 建议用八位或者十位 HS Code。查询结果，您看在这边的最后一列，可以看到是否需要官方推荐。如果显示的是，那么就不能由企业自己提交注册申请。必须通过您的主管部门来推荐注册。如果您的产品的 HS Code 在这个系统中无法查到，那么表示这个产品是不需要注册的。还要注意的是，从二零二二年一月一号开始，对于已经注册并获得注册编号的境外企业，在出口食品到中国时，应该在报关单中填写注册编号，如果没有按照要求填写注册编号的，那么会被视为未注册。未注册企业的食品将不予受理进口申报。因此，如果您的企业已经完成了注册，那么一定要将注册编号告知您的进口商或是报关公司，以便他们能够顺利的清关。最后，可能是一些我们来讲一些可能大部分企业都比较关注的点。首先是大家都很关心的标签问题。之前 Raymond 也讲到，已经注册的境外生产企业，在出口食品到中国的时候，应该在产品的运输包装和独立包装的最小销售单元上标示注册编号。
这个注册编号可以是在华注册编号，也可以是当地主管部门批准的注册编号。根据现在的政策，这个注册编号的标注可以采用额外加贴的方式。另外，关于系统的安全性问题，每个企业都会获得一个自己专有的账号，而且每个企业都仅能看到本企业的注册信息，是无法看到其他企业的信息的。因此，系统中的内容是非常安全的。最后是关于注册网站，在二零二一年十一月三十日之前，可能有一些乳制品的企业还是会通过旧的注册系统，就是这一个链接，来进行注册。那在十一月三十号之前注册的数据仍然是有效的，且会被自动传输到我们现在的新系统。从十二月一日起。旧的系统已经不再接受任何新的申请了，所有企业都必须通过这唯一的链接，也就是 cyphersinglewind.cn 来进行注册。以上就是我今天想要介绍的内容，非常感谢大家。Thank you, Lavinia, for the great presentation.、Um, we have received, we are receiving a lot of questions. We are receiving a lot of questions. I would invite you, please, to write them in the Q and A section of the Zoom rather than in the chat. This will allow us to track them more easily and to and to respond to all of them.、Um, if Lavinia, please, you.、Um, so we have we have received、uh, a call from the officer, from the customs officer, who is going to be slightly late. So in the meantime,、um, Lavinia, if you can please、uh, stop sharing the screen. So in the meantime, we decided to、um, answer some of the questions asked so far, and then once the officer arrives, we will、uh, uh, switch to his presentation. So Raymond, I believe most of the questions are for you and Lavinia. So please、uh, answer you. Mo many of them are similar, and then, but you can answer. You can start answering them. Or Lavinia, Ray, either Raymond or Lavinia. It's up to you. Sure.、Um, so, so Alicia,、um, uh, shall we read out the question and then answer, or will you read out the question? Yes, please. You can also group them together because I see many questions are similar relating to labeling or to 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 packaging in or other packaging. So you can. It's up to you. Okay. Sure. So、uh, maybe I can start with a, a question、um, by Anesta. So、uh, hi, hi Anesta.、Um, I'm just going to read out your question and then answer.、Um, so Anesta's question is: Hello, we produce beverages. If our products have English front labels and back Chinese label, must we put the Chinese code on products? What if the product Is only with English labels. So,、um, just to clarify、uh, that the that the code or the registration number、um, should only be on the、uh, Chinese label. So that that's the only mandatory requirement. So for the original English label,、um, it does not require the the GACC registration number. So usually you would. Have a sticky pasted label in Chinese, so you, you would stick it over the original、uh, label in the native language, and then the Chinese label is the label that should contain the GACC registration number. So we、uh, can move to other questions. And、um, a second question we have uh, from. Uh, Valada.、Um, so Valada、um, has a question: Is it necessary to have GACC registration code on each product unit, or only the transportation packaging? That's a very good question, uh, Valada. Uh, it should it should be on the the registration number should be printed on the Chinese label. Uh, of the minimum sales unit, so actually also needs to be on the retail pack. And in addition, 
the uh, carton, so the packing for the shipment. So the carton also requires the GACC number. Um, it is not required um, to, again, to, to print this number on the original English label of the retail pack, but must be on the minimum sales unit only. So thank you, thank you for your question there. Um, Lavinia, uh, would you like to uh, answer some questions from the uh, audience? Yes, I'm checking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe if I can ask, I, I saw a lot of questions say, what happens if I don't register uh, by 1st of January? Uh, does it mean that they will not be able to export anymore? Maybe this is an easy question, I think. And my understanding is that you will not be able to export. And then if you try to export, your products will be destroyed or, or returned, of course, I think. Uh, is this correct? Until you register, of course. Is my understanding correct? Yes, as, as I just mentioned before, you, when the product arriving at the port, your importer should provide the registra registration number to the local customs. If, if you don't provide the registration, registration number, then the product will not be import, cannot be imported. Yeah. Um, I just want to add, um, if, if uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, maybe, maybe um, you've, already sh you've already have uh, shipments on the way to China without the uh, GACC registration number. So in, in this situation, uh, not, not to worry too much um, because you can also uh, attach or, or paste the GACC registration number when the products arrive at the China port. So usually the, uh, the third party, uh, a third party uh, uh, company or the importer might be able to support with sticking the, uh, the, the GACC number on, on the packaging in addition after the deadline. So, so um, but yes, uh, the, the deadline um, is very clear on the, on, the, um, on the regulation that it should be, it should be registered by, by, by January the 1st next year. Very clear, thank you. Uh, all the questions, uh, there are quite a few in the, in the Q and A, yeah. and again, I would invite all the participants to write the questions in the Q and A section rather than in the chat. Otherwise, it might be difficult for us to follow them. Okay, so so I can see another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, um, a good question. Um, I read out the question. It's hello. Uh, if we want to export UHT milk, registration cannot be done by ourselves. Could you please specify who would be that competent authority which we have to reach out for registration filing? Thank you. So um, this question uh, is a good question. Uh, so UHT Milk, uh, you're right, um, uh, should be registered uh, through recommendation by the local authority. Um, and the local authority uh, or the competent authority will depend on which country you're uh, it, it's manufactured. So usually it is the uh, related uh, authority relating to Ministry of Agriculture or along those lines. So that would be the, that would be the uh, best place to, to reach out to. Thank you, Lavinia, you want to add something? I just saw a question from Samsung. <laughs> yeah, he asked about enterprise registration categories. If there are many products under one category range, should products registered one by one or only register one product and load one picture, please? The answer is you need to register the product one by one and upload the picture of each product to the cipher system. Is it clear? Uh, to me, this, I also maybe something related to this. I saw one question. Uh, I think there might be cases of, of a company having different production facilities. Uh, and sometimes these production facilities are even in different European countries. So, so in this case, what would be 
the solution? Do they need to register just once or all the facilities or? Yes, according to our understanding and our communication with the DACC officer, the answer would be the registration is depending on the site, the manufacturing site. So if you have different sites, then you should register the, do re the registration for each site. Is okay. it clear? Hmm? I think it is. Um, any other questions that you can see in the, while we wait for the officer to join us? Uh, if there are other questions uh, you want to answer, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I see a question. Uh, what happens if the enterprises want to register food from the 18 categories next year? Um, so pre-registration will be closed, right? Um, actually, actually, if you would like to register um, your product from one of the higher risk 18 categories next year, it, it's no problem, it's possible. Um, so you would have to reach out to your local competent authority um, to, to let them know your interest to, uh, to, to sell into the China market. And then your local competent authority will then review your application uh, together and then submit this uh, on your behalf to GACC. So GACC will then review the application. Um, they have a, a schedule which, um, which, which uh, they follow and they will then um, have the opportunity to review your category. But in terms of the timeline, there is no clear timeline um, of when it, it will be approved uh, for, for, your, for, your, for your company, but um, it, it's not closed, it, it still will be open. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, Lavinia, other questions? Yes, here Ruben also asked, what about products manufactured before Jan 1st that arrived to China after that date and have the Chinese label printed from manufacturer rather than a sticker upon arrival? Where it is? Uh, I just uh, answered it, but, but yes, that was the question. I just uh, moved into another part. Okay, okay. But, yeah. Yes, as just mentioned, it is allowed to paste a separate sticker with the registration number on the packaging. So even if you have the Chinese label printed on the packaging, it doesn't matter. You can, you can stick, stick a separate you know, registration number on the packaging. Thank you. Raymond? Yeah, um, I see another question uh, from, from uh, Julia uh, Sappen. Uh, it, it looks quite, he, he seems quite worried um, that it, it seems quite impossible that all companies exporting to China uh, to register by deadline of January 1st. So I assume there will be one more deadline. Would that, would that be possible? Or could there be another deadline? Um, actually, uh, right now, uh, the deadline is uh, quite clear. It is January the 1st, but, you know, um, uh, the, so, so the answer is nobody knows whether, whether China Customs um, will extend this deadline or provide um, some flexibility uh, or grace period uh, for, for, for the exporters uh, later on after the, after the deadline. But, but at the moment, assume that it, that that will be the deadline. Um, and also, I think it would be a, a good question to ask the uh, customs officer later to see if uh, it's possible to give uh, a, such a grace period uh, or, or some flexibility. So uh, th th thanks for that question. Yeah, here I have this question. If the registration, registration number is printed on the bottom of a milk powder can, will this also be accepted by the GACC? Uh, currently, there is no requirement for the place or the area where the registration number should be 
printed or pasted. So yes, it is acceptable to have it on the bottom of the can. And um, yeah, there's, there's another question uh, I would like to answer uh, from uh, Antonelli, the, the, the Rita. Um, so his question is about labeling. So um, can the label be in Italian and English um, for the products already exported? Do we have to inform our distributor? Um, yes, it is advised to uh, inform your distributor. Um, the label uh, should be in Chinese. So it's mandatory to have a Chinese label. So the registration number should be in the Chinese label and not the Italian or the English label. So um, the key point is to have it on the Chinese label. And if, if it's already been exported, then make sure to let your distributor know and to ask them to help you maybe uh, paste another uh, sticker um, with the GACC registration number over the, uh, over, over the Italian or English label. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, before, before giving the floor to Lavinia again, I would like to, uh, I noticed uh, a few questions, uh, again, asking if I'm not the manufacturer, but I'm just a distributor or exporter of the food um, and beverage product. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that in this case, they don't need to register through GACC. They need to do another filing, uh, but uh, it's, it's different from the single window that we are talking about now. The single window is just for manufacturers, process, processing and, and storage enterprises. Am I correct? Yeah, so uh, maybe Lavinia, uh, could, you, could you help answer this question about um, exporter filing, uh, import and exporter filing? Yes, the import and export of filing and the manufacturer registration system is different. Uh, they are different systems and should be done in different systems. If you are only the exporter and you don't manufacture or process or store the products, then you don't need to do the manufacturer registration. You only need to do export of filing. So they are different. Yeah, so um, all exporters who do not manufacture, so for example, brand owners uh, who do not own manufacturing, uh, they must do the exporter filing rather than the, uh, the GACC registration of uh, manufacturers. So um, if you would like the uh, link to the uh, exporter filing, then you can reach out to us later uh, we, we, can, we can share the link with you. Yes, and I want to add one thing that if you are a storage enterprise, but you only store the uh, prepackaged food and in the room temperature, then it is not required to do the manufacturer registration. So the precondition is prepackaged food and room temperature and do not there's no other processing so in under this condition you don't need to do the uh, manufacturer registration thank you lavinia other questions you had yeah so lavinia there's a question uh, quite an interesting one is um there are, in the registration system, it requires the detailed ingredients and the uh, specification. So um, the question uh, one, one, one attendee has uh, is the suppliers are confused about how to input this detailed information. And some are quite unwilling to provide detailed uh, ingredients lists and formulation um, such as the raw material percentage and the production process um, because they're confidential. So what suggestions do you have uh, to advise overseas suppliers? Can you share some of your opinions on this? Yes, actually in the current system, the details for the ingredients or formula is not mandatory. You are optional 
to to choose whether you 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 want to fill in the details or not. So it is not mandatory. If you if you are willing to input all the details, then the ingredients information should include the ingredient name and the source of origin of the raw materials and the proportion in the final uh, product. That is all. Yeah. So just to, just to summarize, uh, currently it's not mandatory to input the formulation, but it's there just as an option if you want to include anyway. And another question uh, um, about cross-border e-commerce. So if, if, um, if the exporter is selling on cross-border e-commerce, is it necessary to register? The GACC registration uh, or the decree 248 is not applicable to cross-border e-commerce. So if you sell products through cross-border e-commerce, then you don't need to register. Yeah, so, so if you sell on cross-border e-commerce only, so like selling on the platform, the cross-border platforms, including Timor, JD, um, so the cross-border sections, do not require the GACC registration. So you can just trade as usual without the registration. I'm uh, just uh, me, looking at additional questions. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are quite a few, and I think there are at least five I counted uh, yeah. about, um, well, I, I think in Europe, it's very common sometimes to outsource the production of a certain product uh, under one brand to another company or to um, so cases like this. And, and what, what, what happens in these cases? Who needs to be the, 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 the one doing the registration, the uh, subcontractor, let's say, or the original company? The company who export products to China should register. So if you don't export products or raw material to China, or you just provide raw material to, to other companies, then you don't need to register. The finished product who export products to China should register. Am I clear? I think so. Um, I think if it's if, if not clear, I think I would invite people who ask this question to, to provide more details or resubmit it. Yes, that's pick up another question. Here I have the Food products we produce include 18 high risk products and beyond 18 low risk products. Shall we register them separately? For example, some with local authorities, some we do ourselves. Yes, if your products cover both uh, within the 18 categories or beyond the 18 categories, then you should register separately. As, as I just mentioned in my presentation, under this condition, you should go to your competent authority for, um, for the account, rather than you register the account in Cypher system by yourself. So when you get the account from your competent authority, then you can use this account to register in the system. If they are high risk, then you should register them by, uh, through your competent authority. If they are low risk, then you just do, do it by yourself. Nice. Uh, th thanks, Lavinia. So, so there's another good question here, which I noticed uh, um, and asked by many companies also. Um, if it's better to register, is it better to register all the categories now or add them later? So as uh, food and beverage importers in China, can we just select all the categories? Because we do not import all of them now, but we might import them in the future. Mm, yes, if you can register all the categories now, then 
yes, it, it's more convenient for you to, to import them in the future. But the, the workload may be quite big. So, uh, yeah, so, or, and the review of the, the DSCC review timeline may be longer than you just, uh, you know, register one or two categories. Mm. Um, maybe sorry for, for the interruption. Uh, um, we we are expecting we are experiencing some delay from our customs officer who was in a meeting. Um, hopefully he should be here soon. But in any case, we will keep answering all the questions we receive. I also see there is still some confusion about uh, what what through what platform exporters only need to register. Um, maybe if you have a link of that platform, uh, if you can write it in in the chat somewhere. Uh, so not the GACC registration, but the one for exporters. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, um, we'll, we'll post that in the link um, uh, right, right, right now. Yeah, we'll we'll find the link right. in there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe something also. Uh, two two questions which I think are very interesting. Have you ever seen any products already with this registration number on the market already, or or it's still? I think this is a very interesting question. Yes, I have not seen any product with the registration number, but I know that some companies have already completed the registration and got the registration number, but it is not mandatory to, you know, to mark the registration number on the label before January 1st. So, so no, no, I think maybe no company will do, do it now. <laughs> they will do that uh after that line hmm. thank so, you and uh, maybe oh yeah please raymond sorry yeah I, I just wanted to add that um because the the registration numbers have only just been recently re recent is a quite recent uh event so i think uh, in terms of companies trying to edit edit the label and and then and then uh, and then roll out in production will take will take some time so that's why we've not we've not seen any uh, on the market uh, yet. But increasingly, that will that will that will be more um, of an occurrence in the future. Yes, and I want to add that actually for dairy products, meat products, both nest and etc. The four categories products they have the manufacturers of the four categories have already been registered by GCC actually always so so you you may find uh, the registration number of a uh, dairy product on the market because they have already got the registration number before right uh, maybe maybe another pretty easy question i think how many days do, do, do uh, are needed once you submit the application until you receive the number because maybe sometimes people might be worried you know we are approaching christmas and if I do it uh, right after Christmas, will I be on time to before 1st of January or how long does it take usually? Actually, the timeline is not clear. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I can, so I can only question. say the timeline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not an easy question. <laughs> yeah, and, and especially overwhelming amount of companies have uh, submitted the application. So the, there's just not enough uh, resources um, for GACC customs officers to review the applications, so um, okay. this will be this this will be uncertain until until uh, a, a lot more a lot more of the applications have been reviewed and approved. So so the suggestion is to do it as soon as possible. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And 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 it, it's likely to be on a on a on an order list. So the earlier you have uh, submitted the application. The earlier your 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 application is likely to be reviewed and then issued, so this should be um, yeah done as soon as possible. I would suggest. Yes, and according to our communication with the GSCC officer, they said that they will try their best to complete the registration before January the first, and they don't want to make any you know influence on the trade. Yeah, so if you can you know submit the registration as soon as possible, then you will get the registration number as soon as possible. Very good.
So um, just uh, going through uh, some more questions. Uh, let me have a look. <laughs> Alavinia, there's one question. Um, um, it's a factory in Italy that produces uh, chocolate, and they're, and they're not a high risk category. So um, the their, their importer agent will help them get the registration on the single window, and the importer asked the the importer asked them uh, for a number, something called. What, what is that exactly? And, and which authority uh, in Italy should issue the number? And how many figures or how many numbers is it generally? Um, because they do not know how to explain to their colleagues in Italy what we need. So um, it'd be great if, if, you could, uh, if you could help answer that. Hmm, actually, the, the number means the registration number approved by the local competent authority. So the uh, registration number approved by local competent authority are different in different countries. So there's no you know, general, for example, uh, how many numbers or or what it should be like. Uh, maybe you can you can find find the, the number on your business license, or or do if if you have the you know duty paragraph, uh, the number on your duty paragraph. Because the the number there's no clear you know. Then uh, no clear requirement for the registry number approved by the local competent authority. But all some uh, generally the registry number should be the number on business license or the duty paragraph. Or the number of your production certificate. Yeah, so uh, there's another question uh, by Maria. Um, is it the same if, if the registration is done by the importer or exporter for not risky products? What do you mean by importer or exporter? The importer and exporter only need to do the filing. Do you mean the importer or exporter will do the registration on behalf of the manufacturer. If, if, if so, then you should first, you know, just as I said, create an account on the Cypher system. And then you need to give your importer <clears throat> or exporter the account and password and all the detailed product information. Then they can fill in the uh, tables or filling the or filling the systems to complete the registration. So the account should be owned by the manufacturer. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, another question, Lavinia, uh, from Axel Del uh, Spurlet. Excuse if uh, I'm not pronouncing the name uh, properly. Um, for products already in China but stored in bonded warehouse and already with Chinese labels, do they have to add the registration number on the inner packaging once it's been released from the bonded warehouse? Good question. Yeah, good question. <laughs> if the product will be released before January the 1st, then no need to paste the registration mm -hmm. number, but if it will be released after that deadline, then yes, the registration number should be pasted on the package. Because the bonded warehouse is not considered the, you know, in the territory of China. So, so it's just a 
out outside China. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have uh, from Michal Lova and Mihalova. Um, Lavinia, uh, does a mother and daughter company should, should register the final product with GAC? Final product can be made in one EU country and exported to China by another EU country. Sorry, can you say that again? So um, a mother or daughter company should register the final product in GAC. So is it the mother company or is it the daughter company that should register the, 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 the registration with GAC? Um, since the, the final product can be made in one EU country and then exported to China by another EU country. It is the, it is the company who manufacturing, who manufacturing or processing the products that need to do the ACC registration. If the mother company only export the products, but without any processing or manufacturing, then the mother company do not need to do the, the ACC registration. So- But it needs to do another registration, right? On another system for export. Yeah, exporter, exporter filing. Right. Uh, yeah, if you can, if you have the link to this system would be, would be very appreciated. If you can paste it in the chat. Yeah, Lavinia, could you could you search uh, the GA yeah. uh, the me, filing now, and then and then share on the uh, live chat. Uh, uh, if now. it if it's the IRE from the custom system, then then I can also paste it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the the link. So the Zhenhai Chukoushan or Dali Shan Xinxi Beiyang System. Yes, yes, correct. Okay, so I'll write in the chat. Okay, um, thank, thank you, uh, Alicia, for sharing that in the chat. Okay. So I so, guess the customs officer <laughs> is not going to join us, unfortunately, but in any case, we keep uh, answering questions now. Okay. So maybe we can answer some questions which uh, were pre-selected for the GACC officer. Uh, sure. Uh, do you want me to share the screen? Yes, okay. Uh, but I think we have answered most of these questions. Um, in any case, I will, I will share them in any case. Um, where is it? I think there's one okay. question uh, about if there's one company with four different manufacturing sites. Yep. Mm, but also, also the second here on, la on labeling, is there any format requirement? Oh, we have mentioned it for, for no other reason, right? Yeah. For, it for now. No formal, but it uh, is suggested to label it as manufacturer registration number in Chinese that is and then the number yeah, in this format. Okay. If you can also type in the chat, it would be very helpful, I guess. Uh, yeah, oh, just, also, uh, okay. yeah. I, um, I also, think Raymond has, has already show, shown that in his slides. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I gave uh, an example of, uh, of how, it, how it could look like. So I think, um, Alicia, if you could share the slides to the audience uh, uh, or the video later, um, then they can. Right. The one with the can, right? Yes, the one with the, yeah. Yeah, with, uh, the, with, the, with the biscuit. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah sorry. <laughs> apologies. We have a couple of very interesting questions. I don't know if uh, we're able to answer them. Yeah, maybe these questions we will check them with the GACC officer later. Okay. Uh, so I will, um, this one. Yeah, so if you have four production sites, so each site should do the registration. Okay. Yeah, that, that, uh, what about that, the second? That's clear enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. What about the following one? We, I think this is a pretty important issue. Yeah, this, this question 
we, sh we, we need to check with the GSC officer. Mm. Okay, so maybe um, yeah, one comment for the audience. We have received a lot of questions, and of course, we cannot answer all of them because of time. But we will uh, answer them by email. Um, if you have, uh, you know, we have well, when you register, you fill the email, so we will answer by email to your questions if we have an answer live. Um, any other questions? Maybe here. Uh, I think we have answered this. Right. Or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe this one. Raymond Lavinia, do you want to take any of these questions? Lavinia, did, did, did you see the question? Yeah. Uh, let me, let me see. Uh, actually, the corresponding relation with the production is not mandatory to fill in. So yeah, it is, you, you don't need to fill in that. OK, that, that's very straightforward. <laughs> um, then, then I think this, these were the questions that we had pre-selected. Uh, but I think. I think maybe we can go back to the other questions we have in the chat since yeah. we have some time. Okay, so th there's another question by uh, an anonymous attendee. Uh, uh, what, what do they mean by the inner and outer packaging for the registration number? Should producers and storage numbers be on them together? Um, so inner packaging and outer packaging. So uh, firstly, the outer packaging refers to the carton. So when you transport your goods, you, you have a outer carton. So firstly, the outer packaging or, or also known as the carton um, will, will also need the registration number. And the inner packaging is actually um, the minimum sales volume. So the retail pack, which, which requires that. Yeah, so I, I understand uh, the customs officer, is, is he online now? Yes, I think uh, he is. So maybe uh, I would just very quickly introduce him and then we can ask him to please answer some of the questions that we were showing before. And I think um, those we did that we did answer. So um, yeah, very quickly, uh, Mr. Mr. Zhao Yang is the director. Um, I think I have some slides here. Uh, here I go. Yeah, uh, Director Zhao Yang is the, is the director of the TBT Research Center for Inspection, Quarantine Standards and Technical Regulations. He has been engaged in the research for uh, of food, chemical, technical trade measures, risk analysis and risk warning for many years. He has won many awards from the minister level awards. He has written dozens of relevant books. And, um, and he is also one of the main drafter actually of uh, JCC, 248 and 249. So um, I will switch to Chinese. Um, I don't know if Zhou Yang Zhu Ren Yes, you can hear me. Uh 你帮我拿一下本儿
生产对应关系中，如果一个企业没有固定的供应商啊，比如说可能是这。这会儿我我从一个呃一个供应商，一个在法国的供应商购买一些原材料，然后下个月从一个在德国的买一些材料啊呃,呃原料，我应该怎么填写这个申请？我们是按照产品的那个，就是你生产产品的生产者来说的供应商，如果这个供应商跟中国，你就写写这个生产者的这个那、这个填写，填写这生产者呀，嗯。明白，那那要是这个呃，所以所以中间商要是是从中间商那儿啊采购也，也也也不能写他们的信息，也是也得是这个呃生产商对吧？不用写呃，不用写供应商，不是不需要写供应商，因为供应商是那个什么的呀，是那个。呃，是，就是他如果自他如果如果他有产品出口到中国，那就他自己来去填写这些内容了。啊，焦阳主任，我补充一下，他这个意思就是说，我们不是有一个生产对应关系里面要填，呃，有一些原料供应商或者是在加工企业、啊、对那边的原料供应商，如果比如说我生产的这个产品啊啊，没有固定的供应商。那你你你，那你就说你这个生产厂怎么叫没有固定的供供应商呢？啊，就是你说来自于不同的，那你能填上，那把你能填全的供应商就填上去啊？都要填对吧？就所有对对对对对哦哦哦，那教任主任，我确认一下，这个其实生产对应关系一定是要填的吗？就是我看是必填项，它肯定是要必填。它必填项的话，它肯定它这个带红心的，带红心的都是必填项。哦，所以现在生产对应关系是必填的。那如果原料的供应商那边，其实我我是如果按我说，就一定要全都填下来，说我只需要填写几个就可以了呢？不是，我就说嘛，只要是红心的，就属于这个必填项，那就是那就是必须要填的。嗯嗯嗯，那这个下还是回到刚刚的问题，没有固定供应商的话，就将所有可能的供应商都填写上去，对吗？对对对对，嗯，哦，那像如果中间商这种呢，也是要问中间商他是从哪些原料制造商那边买的，然后再全都填上去吗？对对对对对，他就就就是填，那就反正填你最那个，就是填你最直接的这个这个供应商，最直接的供应商，对呀、啊，哦，那这个中间商能不能算是我最直接的供应商？其实也是可以的吧。也可以，就是相当于他提供给你的嘛。对对对对对，嗯，哦，好的好的，行，那我明白了。嗯，好，谢谢。那还有下面的一个问题，我觉得就是我们这个第二个问题，也就是有一些商会给我们呃提到这个问题，就是根据要求申请材料应该用中文还是英文提交，但是在欧洲有一些文件。啊、呃，比如说这个境外企业的身份证明文件，主管单据颁发的是当地语言的、本国语言的，比如西班牙语的或者意大利语的，那这种情况是能接受吗？要是不能接受的话，那企业是不是可以采用他们这个商会这样的机构出具的英文身份证明，还是这样也是不可以的？他这样子按照非规定来讲，他是两个语言上是两个条件。一个条件，如果中国跟就是我们国家跟你们这个国家有，呃，减一减要求的，减一减要求，对于申请资料和申请的文字语言有要求的，那就按小先按那个执行。如果没有的情况下，要么就是中文，要么就是英文，这是规规二四八里的规定。嗯，明白。嗯，行，其他的其实我们都差不多都回答了，所以呃。我想请您，教养主任，要是您想啊、呃、补充一些补补充几句关于这个政策的一个背景，或者这个宏观的这个这个背景，还有方向，这个这个新的政策的意思是是是什么？包括对中国的消费者是是是什么意思？啊，首先来讲呢，这个中国制定这个进口食品境外生产企业资格管理规定呢。是符合国际规则的一个做法，因为 FAO 的呃相关文件那个指南当中呢，也对于
呃，进口的这个食品的进口产食品的这个安全性呢，是有相关条款要相关条款的，就是呃，这个国家对于进口食品是有这个呃义务的。第二个来讲呢，它也符合国际惯例，因为目前来自于呃这个美国的也好，欧盟的也好，甚至日本的都有对于进口食品实施境外生产企业注册的管理要求。呃，我们国家这个呢是进口食品境外生产企业做的管体制管理体制呢是，呃，按照国际规则、国际惯例呢来来进行实施的。实施的情况当中来讲呢，呃，这是这是第一个，就是我们也这个这个我们这个制定来讲是符合国际规则、国际惯例的。第二个呢，我们也是在落实法的这个要求，因为《食安食品安全法》里头呢是明确对境外生进口食品境外生产企业呃实施注册呃是有明确规定的。呃，第三个呃来讲呢，我们也是符合，也是呢要进一步的落实我们放管服的这种要求，就是嗯、呃、减轻这个那个程序，这个这个呃简化程序，减少这个文件，呃这那个加快这促进这个产品的进口。再则呢，就是我们也是为了这个呃确保这个进口食品的安全，使这个消费者呢呃不仅仅能够。呃，吃到安全是那个放心的这个食品，而且你能吃到那个品种多样的这个进口食品。所以从这几个方面来讲呢，呃，这次制定制定的这个进口食品境外生产企业注册管理规定，而且这个规定来讲呢，也是把我们的风险管理的理念呢，呃，都融入到了这个呃融入融入到的这个规定当中去。所以说，这就是我们这次这个管理规定当中的一些这个呃情况。非常感谢教员主任，来宾娘，您您想补充一个问题吗？或者，对我笑一下教员主任的那个 PPT slides。嗯，那我嗯、呃，让主任您看需不需要呃，能不能对这个二十八号令做一个比较简单的讲解？哦，就是在宣讲的那部分，第三部分的新注册规定的讲解那边简单的介绍一下。那这样子吧，就是说啊，按照我们首先执行法的规定角度来讲，首先是。进口食品的的境外所有的所有类别的，从原来的目录制管理呢，我们转化成为了全类别食品的这个管理，这个呢就是我们这次法当中的最大的一个变化。呃，第二个来讲呢，呃，为了我们跟食品安全法的这个保持一致，因为食品安全法呢实际上只谈了三类产品，三类食品，一个呢食品，一个呢食品相关产品，一个食品添加剂。那呢，在这个这次我们的。呃，这个食品的进口食品境外生产企业注册呢，主要是针对的进口食品。所以说呢，我们在为了跟那个跟法保持一致呢，所以说我们没有把食品相关产品和食品添加剂呢列入到我们的呃进口食品境外生产企业注册的范畴。再则来讲呢，为了加强源头管理上来讲呢，所有的进口食品的境外生产企业注册呢，由我们这个海关总署呢来进行实施。呃，我我放一下下一张片子。嗯，呃，我而而且呢，我们整个这个境外生产企业注册的管理呢，都是基于这个风险评估的，呃，结风险评估的这个这个理念呢，来进行监管的。呃，我们会对所有的食品呢进行风险评估，这风险评估是参考的各方面的数据，比如说来自于呃生产原料啊，呃监监监督管理方面的数据啊，呃，包括使用的对象啊。还有结合不同国家的管理情况呢，我们把这个食品呢，呃，来确定食品的这个风险，来确定食品的申那个推荐方式，来确定食品呢需要提交什么样的材料呢，来实施这个注册。所以在这种这而且这种风险管理呢理念来讲，不是一个固定不变的，而是一种动态的，是根据实际情况呢会还会进行调整。嗯，再则来讲呢，就是根据这种风险评估结果呢，我们把我们所有的食品分为两大类，一个是官方推荐，一个呢是这个企业自行申请
。那官方推荐呢，我们也根据这个风险评估结果分了十八大类产品。这十八大产品的情况下，那我们也确定了这十八大类由官方来进行推荐，而且确定了五大五五项那个申请书啊，呃，而近近代企业申请注册呢，为了这个呃这个。既能保证我们的安全，又能确定这个你的这个了解到企业的这个情情况，呃，也为了加强便利贸易便利化呢，呃，我们简化了所有的这个企业自行申请的这个文件，而且呢，还提出的那个委托受理人的这种理念，呃，其目的呢，都是为了把这个加快这个呃通关速度，就是实行贸易便利化。然后呢，基于这种情况，我们对于这个材料也做了要求。第一个来讲呢，材料使用中英文的这个要求；第二个来讲呢，也规定了这个材料呢，呃，如就是在做这个双方有这个简易简易签订简易简易条约的这种情况下呢，也是有相关的这个规定的。呃，再往下一张片子，再下一张片子，嗯、呃，而且。嗯，而且呢，我们这次的管理规定来讲呢，是呃，压实了呃这个企业的主体责任，呃，明确了这个主外主外官境外官方企业、官方政府的这个推荐责任和监管责任。呃，而且呢，是特别增加了这个申请人的呃责任的条款。这个申请人实际上组指的就是境外生产企业和呃和这个呃和这个和这个境外主国,国外的主管当局啊。下一页。呃，而且呢，我们这次也明确了这个海关的监管责任。监管责任体现在了两个方面，一个呢，我们改革了原有的这个呃审核审查这个评审制度，这个呢，我们增加了这个视频审查的这种制度。而且呢，我们明确了这个呃海关呢对于国外的这个生产企业实施这个呃整改的呃整改的这个要求，整改措施方面的要求。啊、呃，再往下一页。呃，而且我们为了加强那个事中事后的监管呢，我们采取了这个复查，也就是说，呃，会定期不定期的对于已注册的境外生产企业呢，呃，是否持续性的符合我们国家法律法规的要求呢，实行检查。再则呢，增加的这个信息更改和信息更改和这个呃重新注册的这个要求呢，这个其目的为了保就是确保我们所有的企业呃的信息能够。呃，是最最新的这个企业信息和监管方面的信息，而且我们增加了这个延续注册的这个规定。延续注册呢，我们也从原来的一年，呃，那个改成了六到三个月。这个其目的就为了能够有充分的时间，能够满，能够完成我们的延续注册的这个审批过程。呃，再则来讲呢，呃，我们提规定的这个注销的这个规定，那注销规定呢，包括了三个方面。一个呢是企业自行提提出注销，另外一个是国国外呃主管当局呃提出注销，呃还这是这是第第一个问题。第二个来讲就是没有实施延续注册，那就自动失去了这个呃资格了。还有一个呢就是境外生产企业已经不在呃国外主管当局的监管下实施生产了，这种时候呢我们也实施注销的这个规定。但注销规定当中呢，也有一些特别的规定，比如说你注销的申请是由你什么样的申请途径，就以什么样的是的呃，就以什么样的申请来来提出呃注销的这个申请。呃，再则来讲呢，啊不不不，就是注销当中来讲呢，呃，有有有这么几个来来讲呢是。呃，这个这个哦，注销的就是要要要要注意的是，注销的这个日期是要以国呃海关总署所公布的注销日期呢为准为准。呃，再则呢，提出的这个撤销的这个规定，我们列了七个方面的撤销规定，这头就包括了呃发生的重大的识别安全事件，呃，在检疫检验中发生的这个发现的问题，比如说这个材料虚假申报。呃，比如说这个倒卖，那个那个不配合呃检查，我不配合这个呃海关总署实施审查，呃，比如说呢整改措施依旧呃不合格，还有一个呢就是这个呃，比如说这个对于这个注册编号呢，呃，实施什么倒卖呀、啊，呃这些方面的这个违规使用这个呃注册编号的这种情况，我们都实施那个撤销处理。呃，还有一个来讲呢，我们是对于这个呃公共卫生这个。应急、公共卫生和突发事件呢，也提出了相关要求。那这个六个方面呢，都是对于整个这个呃注册企业的这个事中事后呢，呃实施了加强的监管。再下一张片子。
呃，我们也为了提高这个监管效能来讲呢，第一个呢，我们设立了呃这个在华注册编号，这个以便于统一进行管编管的监监管。第二个来讲呢，就是呃，要求我们的注注册编号呢要标注在食品包装的内外包装上。呃，第三个上来讲呢，就是这个我们也把我们的注册的有效期从原来的四年延长到了五年。呃，也以跟我们国家的生产许可注册呢，呃，时间相一致。呃，那这个呢，就是基本我们简单的给大家这个介绍了我们这个呃法规二四八的这个基本状况。呃，非常感谢教练主主任，我我不知道您这边是不是还有两分钟，解答一个很多人问过的问题，就是关于这个、啊、可以你说吧这个啊，这个标标签的格式啊、呃，嗯，能能能否告诉我们大概什么时候能出台一些这种直男，就是关于这个标签格式的直男。标签这个问题上来讲，我们是呃呃规定是在内外包装上进行标注这个注册编号，并没有规定标注在什么位置，也没有说标签的形式，只要你标注这个在华注册，在华注册编号或国外的注册编号就可以了。呃，至于这个呃整个这个标签的管理上来讲，涉及到这个标签的管理上，将按照其他的有关规定和标准来进行执行。嗯，明白。拉维尼亚，您您还有其他的问题吗？哦，我现在这边暂时没有问题了。行，其实其实我们这边还有很多问题，包括就是要是、哦、没关系的，我我我，你一个有还可以再问问问一下吧。嗯啊，包括就是要是来不及完成这个申请，就是二二年一月一号之前，呃，来不及完成这个申请是是是怎么办？就是呃，明年也可以注册，还是还会有新的一个注册期限，还是？没有注册是随时都可以实施的。你你现在完没法进行注册，你就明年、呃、明年再继续注册呗，随时都可以注册的。嗯，行，那大概要是提啊，行、嗯，那我要是提交申请，我要是我今天提交申请的话啊、呃，大概过几天才能得到这个这个注册号。但是取决于你申你提交的材料的这个情况，无论是官方的还<笑>企业的，就是你你你提交的材料越前越准确。呃，我们这边所批复的就会越快，呃，这个完全取决于你们的、啊。我们从海关这边来讲，会加快我们所有的那个企业的这个、这个、这个，就是审批的这个速速度的。啊，那那要是已经有，已经在国内的一些自贸区啊，或者这种保税区啊，但是还没有出出这个这个保税区，那那那那怎么办？就是要是一月一号以后出。是不是需要这个标签，还是不需要？那个标签上来讲，规定是二零二一二二年一月一日是以后生产的，需要标标注在标签上。而那个二零二一年的呢，按照原规定执行。但是从二零二二年一月一日起呢，在你进行那个报关申请的时候呢，就必须要填报这个在华注册编号，在我们的呃相关的那个单单一窗口当中。呃，不，那个那个资质项当中要填报这个。嗯，明白，很清楚。呃 ，Raymond， 你这边有其他的想问的问题吗？嗯，呃、我我这边呢，呃，暂时没有。嗯，好吧 ，Levinia， 你你看到那个 audience 还有其他问题吗？我暂时没有。呃，我。嗯，行，嗯，所以呃呃，老老老师呃，我我想确认，就是如果是嗯、呃、是一月一号之前呢生呃，就生产的嗯、呃、这些这些这些呃呃货呃，就就就不用呃标签那个呃申请号。在那个，在那个呃标签上，对吗？对，就是标签上标注是二零二二年一月一日以后生产的，但是从二零二一月一日起、嗯，你一定要有在华注册编号，呃，一定要在那个系统申报报关的时候填写这个规范的填写在华注册编号。哦，好，因为有很多企业这些现在问呢，如果他们现在已经嗯、呃、已经呃在。在呃出口到到到到到国内，然后
呃，清关的时候就就啊，一、呃、月就就超过那个一月一号，那他会不会有一些呃问题呃，个清清清不了关？有有很多的问题。我我不讲了吗？就是一月一号这个节点，首先你需要有在华注册编号的问题。嗯，你如果说你现在没有拿到在华注册这编号，你在一月一号，现在你可能还可以进口，但是在一月一号你就进不去，没法进口。好，谢谢，谢谢。嗯，那那那那要是有一个企业生产一个一些就是两个两个渠道的产品都生产，它是不是需要注册两次，还是就注册一次就够了？不是注册两次，就是你注册的的的，你你你你就同时注册呗。你你你你需要注册生产企业的，就需要注册加工企业的，你就都要都同时注册呗。嗯，行。那那还有一个情况，这个在欧洲也比较。多就是有时候一个一个产品的一部分加工是在比如说法国，然后另外一个另另外一部分加工在西班牙或者意大利。那那这个情况是是是是,是怎么怎么着，怎么注册？那你你不是就是按照规定注册？我没太明明白你这个问题当中的点。就是比如说有一个公司一个集团可能旗下、嗯，喂，喂。他可能信号不太好，现在有点断。啊，啊是什么意思的啊？他应该是说，哎 ，Hello， 哎，我我刚断了。我我的意思是，有有时候有一个集团旗下有好几个子公司，然后每个子公司都分别负责产品的呃加工过程的一部分。就是比如一个子公司在法国负责一个产品的一部分加工，然后另外一个子公司负责加工过程的另外一个部分。你报的意思吗？是是，到底是这个子公司还是这个这个子公司还是母公司注册的？那是你这个子公司如果要出口到中，这个他所生产的这一部分也需要出口，那他也需要来注册。但是母公司他把这些子公司的产品收集到他这块来之后，就都作为一个配料，形成一个新的产品，那就是母公司在做这个注册嘛？嗯，好的，明白。呃，行，我我这边也没有别的问题了。那那那，要是 Lavinia、Raymond 都没有问题的话，呃，就我们到这儿。其实我们已经晚了二十二十来分钟。然后我想，呃，没事，没关系，没事，没关系。我们我们理解我。呃，非常感谢你在傍晚中抽出时间来参加我们这个活动。然后我相信我们现在。很多呃，所有与会只对这个二十八、二十九号的了解更清楚一些啊、呃，然后相信我们很多企业都会来得及完成这个申请，所以再次感谢您。嗯，抱歉，抱歉，抱歉，嗯、没关系。好的，谢谢。嗯，谢谢，谢谢。好的，好的。好，谢谢嘉阳主任。啊，行，没事，没事，谢谢，谢谢。嗯，嗯那我现在就说英语啊，我这就我们就到这儿结束啊。Uh, so, so uh, we uh, finally we have managed to um, complete this webinar. We are a bit late, 25 minutes. Really, our apologies for that. Uh, but we we also see that there are many many questions in the in the Q and A section that we haven't answered. It's just many questions. It's 80 questions so far. Uh, this shows that it's uh, the situation is still very very confusing. But hopefully, piece by piece, we will be getting there. I also know that there are um, most of the EU national uh, the member states national authorities in China are also dealing with this. Um, I I'm confident that soon the situation will be very clear to everybody. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, maybe I will just to share my screen again for one last time. Um, here it goes. Uh, we will sh uh, share the slides of this presentation and also the recordings uh, to you after, the, um, after this webinar. Not today, we will do it tomorrow. Um, now here, I would like to invite all the audience, please, if you could take one minute of your time to scan this QR code and let us know what, what you think about this webinar, if it was um, useful or not. And we will really appreciate that. Um, and for, for, for any questions that were not answered, we will try to respond by email uh, one by one. Uh, probably it will take a few days because of the very high number of questions that we received, but we will certainly do that. Um, so please um, be a little bit patient. I know it's urgent. Uh, we will try to do our best. 
Um, so that's it. Uh, I don't know if Raymond Lina Lavina wants to say some, some and concluding remarks before before we end the webinar. Yes, uh, th thank you very much for, for all those uh, are still online and, and, and listening and um, happy to answer any questions uh, uh, also by email. Um, so you can also contact me uh, uh, later. So thank you very much again. Bye bye. Thank you so much. So if you have any additional question, you follow up question, you can just send by email and we will try our best to answer your questions. Thank you for your time today. Bye bye. Yes, Lavia, we'll send the questions to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Have a good evening.